Hello from the Hoboken Historical Museum. We are streaming out live to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. This is Hoboken Talks, where on Thursday nights, we talk about Hoboken. <laughs> and it is Pride Month still, so we are themed for Pride Month. My name is Ali Blumenfeld. I work at the Hoboken Public Library, and I'm here tonight with our guest, Jean Farnbach of Hoboken Rainbow Family. There we are. Before we talk about Hoboken Rainbow Family, um, I'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself, your family, and your history here in Hoboken. Sure, and first, thank you for having me. Happy to be here and have this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so uh, Hoboken, we have been in Hoboken um, with a brief hiatus of seven years. Um, since the since 2010, uh, we actually ran, like, we discovered Hoboken in the middle of a snowstorm after um, we had some difficulties with previous residents and moved here and absolutely, absolutely love Hoboken. Hoboken is uh, this great, small town feel, big city feel combo right next to, to New York City. Um, we've, we've been back in Hoboken now since 2018. Uh, we, me, my wife, and our seven-year-old, um, we, we live in Hoboken, love Hoboken. Our kid goes to school in Hoboken and couldn't be happier, happier to be here and happier to be here on Hoboken Talks. Yes, excellent. I also wanted to add that we are monitoring the chat. So if anyone has any questions or comments to make, uh, please feel free and, and we'll see them. We'll be able to respond. So any questions for Jean, um, please feel free to, to enter them in. Um, so there's so much to love about Hoboken. There really is. I just started working at the library in April and um, I love the city so much. What's your favorite thing about Hoboken? I love how there's just this really strong community. It's very family friendly. You can walk anywhere and and run into people, run into parks. Uh, there's always great things to do here, and we're hoping that eventually we'll we'll have a really strong, vibrant queer community here as well. That will just make Hoboken an even uh, better better community to live in. Yes, yes. Um, so now I do want to talk about still a little bit more about your family. Um, you know, when when we start our families, there's a lot to think about. Um, especially if you're lucky enough to have the choice to start our families. What was it like for you to start your queer family? So we had an intentional decision to start our family. Uh, being in a, a lesbian relationship, um, it's, it's not something that's just going to happen generally by accident. Um, we made the conscious decision, actually when we were out on Long Island, that we wanted to start trying to build a family, uh, looked into sperm donors, um, figuring out what characteristics did, did we want. What um, My wife is Asian, so we wanted to have a sperm donor that shared some of those characteristics. So our child would be able to be to be seen as like both of, of their parents. Um, we actually worked, we, we tried to do it first at home, DIY, and then we actually did end up working with a, a reproductive specialist uh, to assist with that. And, and one of the first things they asked us was, well, you're going to have to go into some sort of therapy to discuss this, have a counseling session. And we looked at them and we're like, but this is the only way that, that we can actually have children. It's, it's not like there's um, two partners in a heterosexual relationship and one of them is unable to have children with either their sperm or their eggs. Um, there's no other option. So do we really need to do the counseling, especially since we've been trying for the last six months? And they're like, okay, that makes sense. We'll have to revisit our policies and see if this is something that's actually relevant mm -hmm. for, for some of our some of our clients, which I thought was actually really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, interesting that it was happening, the conversation in 2013, that that, that, that conversation was still happening. Um, but there was conversations about who was going to be the birth parent. Um, did either, like, I, I wanted to to carry our child. My wife did not. So that was actually a pretty easy conversation. But in, in some intentional families, um, you, the, the, the parents are going to have to make that determination, have mm -hmm. that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the decision is to have 
one child at one time and the other parent care the the other child if, if, if that's what the decision is. Um, and then now what we're actually looking at is um, doing a second parent adoption mm -hmm. in order to make sure that the non-birth parents' rights are are protected, especially since the political climate is, is the climate is changing. Mm -hmm. Getting, you know, we just want to make sure that, that our child is protected and that our family right. is protected. Right. It's a unique experience to create a yes. queer family. And all you've these done different... this as well. Yeah, exactly. And the same sort of questions being asked and the same sort of barriers and, and hurdles and, and extra questions that, that a lot of people don't have to ask. Um, I just did second parent adoption in last year and I'm so glad I did. So I'm glad you're going <laughs> <laughs> to do it too. Um, but those challenges and, and, and the unique experience that we have, um, you know, it's part of, part of being in our community. Yeah. And um, so I wonder if you could speak to why finding community is so important for LGBTQ families. Sure, so I think a lot of it is about visibility and connection. Um, parts of the, the queer community are very visible and parts mm -hmm. of it can be, can be hidden. Um, but many people in the queer community, and really, I'm, this is, I'm speaking from my experience, this is not a general statement for everyone, um, but there are certain almost traumas of being part of a group, a class of individuals that has been historically discriminated against, um, that people not in that group, in that community, may not understand or may not um, recognize to the same extent. So having a group of, of individuals that has those same similar experiences um, is just, it's, it's refreshing sometimes. Um, you don't have to be educating everyone all the time if you're if you're in some area some some part of your your life where where you're surrounded by like-minded individuals mm -hmm. even even very strong allies i mean it's right. it, there's something different about having queer community um, queer community with with kids um, and and both of that i think is actually really important and Queer community doesn't just need to be in bars. Queer community is everywhere. It's anywhere where we are. So queer community at, at the beach, at the playground, at the park, just walking around in town, having that visibility. Um, so other kids, as they're growing up, they're like, oh yeah, it's it's normal. This is a normal part of, of society. And mm -hmm. there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with me. And I think that there's also like there is still a lot of internalized homophobia um, that that people are just dealing with. So having that that sh group that has shared values, shared experiences, I think is is really helpful. Yeah, um, something that struck me from what you said um, was just that concept of visibility and showing queer life in different places, mm -hmm. not just the bars, not just um, you know pride parties or things like that, but which are fun. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. We're not <laughs> not trying to get rid of that. Um, but yeah, put it, you know, pride in the park, pride on the beach, you know, yes. pride in different different parts, pride walking down the street, you know. Pride you know. and pride 365. Mm -hmm. I mean we we are not we are not queer just in June. It's, or August. If you're in Hudson August. County, you get to be you get to, you get to be queer twice if you're in Hudson County, and two I months think, of the year. And maybe sometimes in October. Um, but True. it's it's a year-long thing. So seeing companies go all out for us on commercials and everything in June is always great. I mean, I, I love seeing the inclusive commercials. I just wish that the inclusive commercials happened year round. It wasn't just a, this is June. So now we're going to, we're going to do our queer inclusion this month. Um, it'd be nice if we saw that diversity throughout the year. And, and that's mm -hmm. part of what, what we're trying to do with, with Hoboken Rainbow Family is to really build that diversity and build that inclusion um, and that visibility to a, to be a year round thing, not just a, June or summer item. Right. So Hoboken Rainbow Family <laughs> is the perfect segue. Um, when did it start? And tell me about its beginning. Sure. So we actually started Hoboken Rainbow Family last June. We went to a, a Pride event actually at the library and met a few folks and we're talking mm -hmm. about how there weren't a lot of, of queer groups in Hoboken. And we were saying, oh, someone should make one. And then we're like, Okay, well, if someone should make one, 
and no one is making one, well, we can make one. Um, so with um, with my wife and a few other folks that we, we met at the, the library event, uh, we started a Facebook group and we, we launched, I believe middle of June, we uh, launched as Hoboken Rainbow Family and put out our first event as, I believe, uh, meet and greet at the at, at one of the parks. Mm. And we're just like, we will be here. If you want to come, it'd be great to see you. And uh, a handful of folks showed up um, that we still see regularly and are part of like, what we call now like the core Hoboken Rainbow Family group. And it's been really great. Uh, the The organization is is more active online mm -hmm. than it is in real life, and that is something that we are really wanting to um, to work on. We we really do want this to be not just a virtual community. Uh, we want to have those interactions in person at the park, at a restaurant, walking mm -hmm. down the street, um, because it's it's important to have that visibility in real life as well as that visibility virtually, although virtually is good too. What are some of the, I guess, successes of the virtual atmosphere? Well, we have been able to connect with a lot of people in Hoboken, people who have maybe really little kids and, and they're not necessarily going to be going out to large events, especially when we first started, when we were still really in the pandemic, although mm -hmm. we still are in the pandemic. Um, but but families that maybe aren't comfortable meeting in person, but still want to have some of that community aspect. Um, having just like being able to post resources. So maybe there's something that, that we've we've seen, we've actually, we've, we've gone to a few of the North Jersey Pride events this year, and we run into all of the various community groups. So we'll take information from those community groups. We'll snap pictures, we'll get swag, and then we'll post it on the Facebook page so we can provide resources um, as, as part of sharing that, that visibility and, and really making it an inclusive environment. Um, but we are, of course, we, we are still doing our live events and, and really want to, to encourage people to, to meet up, um, but also connect in the group mm -hmm. and, and say, hey, someone else, like, I want to do X and be like, that's be great. We'd, we'd love you to, to do- To see it branch to, off and branch have off. a life of its own too. Yes. Um, so tell me about some of your first Hoboken Rainbow Family events. You said the first one was in a park, and then you started hosting more formal get-togethers. So for Pride last year, we did have several formal events. So we had uh, yoga on the pier. We had a friendship speed dating event at one of the parks. We did a uh, still life drawing at one of the parks. And then we had a game night or a I guess, game afternoon, also at the park. And, and all of our events were outdoors last year because um, pandemic. Um, we do, and, and then we also instituted a monthly book club and we're actually still continuing that. So we do have a, a book that we read on a monthly basis. We meet at the end of the month each month and we alternate between uh, graphic novels and, and non-graphic novels, but usually fiction, um, sometimes non-fiction. And that's actually been a really great way to, to start to build up that group. Of people who are coming coming more regularly. And we are seeing some new faces, um, but everyone is welcome to to Queer Book Club. Um, we, we, we love to see everyone <laughs> and we discuss the book or we don't. Feel free to come even if you haven't read it. <laughs> Our children welcome, our families welcome. Yes, this, this is a family friendly, as, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, my wife and I have a seven year old. Uh, they come to all of the book clubs and they've read about half of the book so and if we have a graphic novel they'll mm -hmm. they'll read at least part of it mm -hmm. they don't usually read the the, the more dense <laughs> sure. more adult style books but, right. but, but but kids are absolutely welcome families are absolutely welcome that's great um <laughs> <laughs> we just got a question from dean thank you dean in the in the comments from facebook Dean asks, how do you feel about the fact that Roe is probably just the tip of the iceberg as to what's coming? I think that you probably um, have an idea of how I feel based on, on the reaction that I had when I saw the question pop up on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is very, it's sad and it's scary. And I'm wondering how am I going to protect my family and my family's right to exist? 
we just got the right in the country for gay marriage in 2015. That's not that long ago, seven years ago. New York had, had gay marriage a little bit before that, 2011. These are not ancient rights that we have. These are rights that that we've been fighting for since Stonewall, since pre-Stonewall, with that, with the initial protests and then celebrations and, and visibility and normalization. And I, I think it is, it's a scary time, um, but I'm still hopeful that we're not going to lose the progress that we've made. Um, but that is one of the reasons why we are now going down the route of having a second parent adoption um, in order to at least solidify um, in a legal sense, uh, rights that would come naturally and, and just as right of course for individuals in a cis hetero to heteronormative uh, relationship. So do you yeah. have any? <laughs> well, second, second parent adoptions are um, is something that I've been uh, definitely sharing with my queer community, making sure that uh, people know that that it's it's quite important. A birth certificate is just a uh, just a document. It, it's not a legally binding document, um, and so the second parent adoption just really solidifies the connection between the non biological parent and the child. And um, that's something that you know, like uh, adoptions, you know, can't be taken away. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, well, you know, sort of. You know, my next question, I suppose. You know, to jump from that, but but really, my next question was about successes and challenges, mm. and you know, the political climate, the pandemic climate. You know, these are things that that pose challenges when you're building community, um, and uh, you know, as you're doing, being a leader in the community, building community from the ground up. So, um, I would love to hear what are some of the successes and challenges over the last year of Hoboken Rainbow Family. Absolutely. So, I think that we have. Um, made really good strides in that that virtual community. So we have uh, a Facebook group, we have an Instagram page, and we actually have a website um, that that provides information about Hoboken Rainbow Family, the events that we're we're having, um, providing resources in an area for families and individuals um, to connect. And I I do want to actually clarify, Hoboken Rainbow Family is not just for people who have kids. Hoboken Rainbow Family is family in the true sense. It's it's our queer family. It's it's meant to be inclusive and all encompassing. So, building that space, um, building connections between uh, the queer space and uh, the overall general community and and allies. Um, I have. I mean, Hoboken has a great ally. Ship. Like Hoboken is, is is really like the parents that I interact with are all so um, so happy to be involved and learning and sharing um, and really want to make the space a space safe for for our kids for maybe their kids. Um, whenever we've we've put out notices to the community in general, like we're trying to create this space, this safe space for kids drop in center, or maybe collaborate with the library. And we were trying to collect resources. Um, folks on on some of the parent groups, we really like that's fantastic. Is there is there an Amazon wish list that we can we can get books and have them sent to wherever the space the safe space is going to be. So I think that that that's actually been really great. Um, but building the the in real life, community that just takes time that's mm -hmm. that's a harder thing to do people have people have very busy lives people already have communities outside of the queer community and figuring out what are activities that people are interested in what what what's the what's that one thing that's going to be that draw that's going to pull someone and say yep that's what i'm going to do on this saturday i want to go on that fun run with Hoboken Rainbow mm -hmm. Family, or on that Sunday, and I want to go to that June climbing event at the Gravity Vault, and like any of these events. Uh, so we're we're still working on that. And actually, if anyone is it has any ideas on things that they would like to to see Hoboken Rainbow Family do, or organizations that would want to partner with Hoboken Rainbow Family, I know that we've discussed having the library partner, mm -hmm. um, and, and developing that that community and that connection more. Uh, 
um, I think that that's that's a really important goal for for us going forward. Um, and we've already started doing that, but but we want to continue doing that. It sounds like you're trying to find activities or interests that will bring people together as another layer of community. Yes. Um, just because you have queer families together in a room doesn't mean they have anything in common besides the fact that they identify as LGBTQ. Yes. Um, and so you're trying to find, you know, activities and, and interests like climbing, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, and running, you know, people who, who run and climb and, 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 and take part in those activities and, and readers you know, um, they already have a sense of community. And so you're building these, this like, you what know, is next the intersectionality? Level. Right, exactly. Yeah. Between different yeah. communities. Right. Um, yeah, that's excellent. Um, so I asked before, you know, and this sort of ties back um, when we talked about why finding community is so important um, for queer families. Um, but I'd love to know what it's meant for your family for your spouse, for your child mm -hmm. um, specifically? Um, what has it been like to connect with other queer families? Um, I'd love to hear about Wixie's you know, experience mm -hmm. finding other children that are in queer families and what that experience was like for them. So having queer family friends is, it's just, it's nice to have friends who have the same experiences other kids where they have two moms or two dads. And then just, it's not like we're any different. Like they, <laughs> there's still two parents and they're still telling the kids what they have to do. You have to go to school, you have to brush your teeth, but it's 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 not the same. I mean, every, like all the kids in, in Wixie's class, I, I assume, because I actually don't know, but um, they don't have two moms. They, they all have, it appears that they mm -hmm. have uh, a, mom, a mom and a dad. Um, having that connection where there's where it's not just the mom and the dad or something else, um, it's it's been really nice. But I think that the thing that's actually been most beneficial for Wixie has been finding other kids that are either non-binary or trans. And I think mm -hmm. that that's been something that's been been a real a real blessing for for Wixie. We we've met a few families recently, um, and met up with with some family actually when we were some friends when we were out of town who have queer or non-binary kids and they just they're it's a different energy out of them they they just mm -hmm. they're they're really like beaming almost and really excited that they've met other kids that are like them not that they aren't friends with all of the kids in their class and they have very close relationships but it's a different type of relationship mm -hmm. being able to connect with someone on that, that that deeper level because they have these shared experiences I think mm -hmm. that that's been that's been really that's been really great for them. Yeah, um, you know, as adults, we we know people are like us. Some of us do, at least. You know, those of us lucky enough to live in these metropolitan areas with access to media and access to the internet, you know, we can seek out virtual or even you know one way, you know, being a fan of a movie or a TV show and just seeing yourself in some way. Um, but children don't always have that because children don't always have the same agency as adults to seek this information on their own. Um, and when you mentioned safe spaces, that is, you know, that is the library is great. You know, any library yeah. should aim to be a safe space where people can find information. Um, but to create these spaces in person where you can meet and children can see other children like them, family structures similar to theirs. You know, it really can't be understated how powerful that can yeah. be for a child because, you know, adults, we we kind of, we not that we all have that, and I don't want to take that for granted, but it may be a little bit easier for us to find oh, it we, than for children. Because we can, we can actually go out and search, we search can it do for it. ourselves. Right, right. And there, there is a question from um, Ellen Kramer Frey about working with school districts to make kids and families feel safe. And actually, that's one of the things that Hoboken Rainbow Family um, has has really been trying to do. We do make ourselves visible to um, all of the schools in, in Hoboken, or at least the public schools and, and most of the charter schools and, and some of the private schools, maybe not maybe not all of them yet. Um, but we we definitely want to have that that partnership, um, not just for 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 queer kids, but also just for for any kid that that wants to have that that safe space uh, maybe their siblings are somewhere in in that that queer queer space maybe 
um, one of their siblings is trans or, or non-binary, or maybe they're trans or non-binary. Um, and some of the things that, that we've discussed with, with uh, Wixi School are, uh, and actually Wixi School, since Wixi came out when they were four, um, being just gender inclusive. So not segregating the kids, boys and girls. Um, having bathrooms that are accessible, that are not just the boys' bathroom and the girls' bathroom, but making a, a gender inclusive bathroom available uh, for kids, uh, having resources available in the classrooms, uh, making sure that teachers are, are aware of, of how to maybe address their, their students and their, their kids. Um, because if, if the kids haven't been exposed to a non-binary or a trans kid before, uh, maybe they aren't going to necessarily know how to how to, to to interact. I mean, and not like kids play; they're they're great at playing. But but using correct pronouns or whatever the the chosen pronouns are, um, we we actually have shared a, a number of resources with Wixie School, um, various books um, and and other other resources. To, to provide some of, of, of that exposure. Um, I think that schools are better about discussing queer history and, and pride at the older grades. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's it's harder sometimes to, to discuss it at the younger grades, the, the kindergartners, the first graders, the second graders. But kids are identifying and identifying their gender identity or examining their gender identity at really young ages. So if we're not providing them the language on how to discuss how they feel um, in a safe space, then then other kids are not necessarily going to know that that's okay, mm -hmm. and that it's it and, and how to how to interact respectfully with with the with the various I mean with any with any kid actually, um, but I think that's something that that's that's super important. And if there's anyone from any of the schools watching right now or later, and you want to get in touch with us. Um, please do. We we actually um, we would love to be involved in in any conversations that you may want to have discussions. But we also actually have a whole bunch of resources from the various uh, local groups that that work with schools to make schools safer for for all of our kids. But I think that one of the other things that's really important um, when when having any kid, this is not just for for my like my seven year old or or for kids who are trans or non-binary, but, but providing diverse media. Mm -hmm. So books that show a variety of characters, um, two moms and two dads and a family that's run, that's, that's headed by a grandma or a family where there's a, a mom and a dad and a stepmom, um, all sorts of, of, of different um, races, um, disability, and gender inclusion and identity. Um, one of the one of the the series is that we really like are the the questionnaires series. I don't know if anyone's familiar with them, but like the Aaron Slater illustrator and the the Rosie Revere. Um, oh, what is it? It's the Rosie Revere engineer. Like they do a really great job of being inclusive without that being the story. And those stories are important too. Like the I Have Two Moms books are great or the I Have Two Dads books. Um, when we have a book on, on just being you that we've, that we've read with Wixie for, for years now, just talking about um, gender identity pronouns. How do you feel? Like, what do you want to be called? Do you want to be he, him? Do you want to be they? Do you want to be she? Do you just want to use your name? But sometimes just having the characters in the book and just allowing the kids to enjoy the story, but see themselves represented is, is really powerful. We actually, over the last fall, we were up at a bookstore in Albany and we're like, we're looking for a book with a non-binary character. Do you have any suggestions? And, and the, one of the, the um, booksellers was like, Cardboard, oh, what is it? Cardboard Kingdom. It's a mostly non-verbal book, mostly just pictures. But there is a, a non-binary character. And the first time that, that Wixie saw that, they were just overjoyed. There is a character in this book that is like me. And that's something that, that doesn't happen that often. And it was just such a powerful moment. 
So yeah. just having that visibility everywhere is really great. Yeah. Well, you know, I love a conversation about books. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Representation is so important in books, and and I, I love what you said. Not only, um, you know, the story doesn't have to be about, um, you know, it's it's just the background characters, the examples in the book. Um, my daughter was gifted a book by a dear friend of ours uh, overseas in London, and the book is called Bodies Are Cool, awesome. and it's uh, it's about you know you see people with scars, people with freckles, people just with different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, but on every page, you see just this incredible diversity of, of how, different ways to be. Um, and I love, I love books like that where, you know, I think it's just so important that, you know, no matter what the topic is, um, there's representation in the book. I'll have to check out Cardboard Kingdom. Cardboard Kingdom. It's awesome. I'm blanking on this other book that was written by Jonathan Van Ness. It has a non-binary hamster. Oh, the one that wanted to dance? Yeah, uh, yeah like a rhythm, rhythmic gymnast. Yes. I don't remember the name of the book. If somebody knows, please <laughs> write in the chat. <laughs> um, but yeah, the book is about a, a hamster who wants to be a rhythmic gymnast. But guess what? You know, the hamster is they Peanut them. Goes for Peanut. The gold. Peanut goes for the gold. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I should have remembered. Peanut. Um, but Peanut is non-binary. Yeah. You know, and that's, I don't know. I love it. It's just, it's just who the character is. It's mm -hmm. not, there's not a big preamble about it, it's just mm -hmm. who they are there's no like struggle or you know it's just joy it's yes. just you know queer trans non-binary joy in these stories yes. you know which we that. need more of oh yeah definitely so <laughs> <laughs> what are your plans for 2022 what's been going on um do you have plans for the summer for august yeah um yeah so we are continuing the book club. Uh, we will actually be having our, our next event at the end of next month, where we're reading uh, the book Rick, which is a sequel to the book Melissa. Uh, the book club is the most consistent thing that we do. We do have book club once a month, and, and we do put out a poll, um, typically at the end of the previous month's book club, about what book do we want to be reading. We don't have any new events planned at this moment. Uh, we did actually have a, a climbing event in uh, that was co-sponsored by Gravity Vault that was two, two weekends ago that was really well attended. And then we actually had a table here at the Hoboken Historical Museum the beginning of June as part of, of the, the kickoff to Pride uh, where, we, where we had arts and crafts. And, and one of the, the hallmarks of a Hoboken Rainbow Family tabling event is that there will be arts and crafts. Um, this year, it's been perler beads. Now, if anyone's interested in perler beads, check out our check out our next tabling event someplace. Um, but we'll, we we do a lot of like if if there's a like festivals and fairs, we we sometimes do try to have have a table, and then we'll we'll, we'll do another event. And, and the events are always on our our Facebook page, but also our Instagram, um, and and just the the normal Hoboken Rainbow family web page. Do you have any? long-term plans or plans for growth and what's going on in your mind at least for the future <laughs> uh we we want to continue to build the community engagement and and to really encourage other folks to step up and and have shoot offs like if there's an activity that that you guys really want to do that that we're not planning um would be great if if other people wanted to do that as well but it doesn't just have to be Hoboken Rainbow Family. It can be Hoboken Rainbow Family. It can be Gabriel Hoboken. It could be any other new group. Um, we really just want to see continued visibility in mm -hmm. Hoboken to make Hoboken as visibly progressive as everyone feels and thinks that it should be. So that that's that is the ultimate end goal is to is to continue to build community, mm -hmm. continue to drive involvement and visibility. Um, while providing uh, safe spaces for our kids to to grow up into healthy, well-adjusted, hopefully, adults. Wonderful. How can local families or other organizations get involved? So please reach out to us on either our, our website or our, our email address. Uh, it's hobokenrainbowfamily.org. 
Uh, we would love to partner with any organization that is interested in um, doing a, a joint event, um, having having resources available, um, having someone maybe come in and, and have a story time or or even a, like a question and answer session at a school or, or anything. Um, really happy to, to be involved in that sense. Um, we really want to be partnering with the community. This is is this is hopefully a group for the community for Hoboken, um, for everyone in Hoboken, not just not just queer families. We do really want to make sure that that everyone feels um, that they have the resources available to be as accepting and to be as much of an ally as they can. Um, there and there's a lot of things that that everyone can do to be an ally. Of of queer kids and and non-binary and trans kids, but anyone, um, is being like being tolerant, being accepting of of kids. Um, if your kids come out to you, being but believing them, um, examining our own prejudices, and I would say that that's that's something that that I still need to work on as well. As I as I mentioned at the beginning, um, ingrained homophobia is. is it's not just something that's for straight people. It's something that's that's very prevalent in in the queer community as well. Um, so so examining our own biases and and taking steps to to really move um, past that if possible. Um, creating an accepting and open home for discussions to allow kids to ask questions that, that maybe are uncomfortable mm -hmm. without judging the question, um, allowing them to the space to examine who they are and, and how they feel and, and letting, them, letting them feel safe in that space. Um, providing diverse media, um, not just books, diverse videos, diverse TV shows, all, that's really important as well. Uh, there, ha there is not as much queer representation in in videos and TV and and movies as as I would like. It, it would be great if um, Disney had more queer representation. There's been a lot of boy meets girl, girl falls in love with boy, they get married, the end of the movie. There's not a lot of examining other other types of like, families. Mm -hmm. So so. That would be, I mean, that would be, that'd be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, but including like working with schools to bring in my, more diversity. And it doesn't have to come just from, from the few queer families that are in a particular school. Having allies also involved in that conversation mm -hmm. is, is really important because it shows the school that it's not just providing a benefit to this one kid or this one family, but it's something that the community as a whole really wants and is asking. Um, especially in this in this political environment, um, speaking up, making making our voices heard, that these are things that are important um, mm -hmm. that we want to that, that we want to embrace. I think is 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 really important. What are some other local organizations that you've worked with, or uh, where folks can go to you know find other avenues of community, other resources if they want to get involved in all of these amazing. Um, initiatives and ideas that you're discussing, whether it's um, advocating in, in their schools for their mm -hmm. children and their children's friends. Um, yeah. You know, what are some other organizations that are local that you're aware of? So there's some actually some really great um, organizations local to Hudson County. Hudson Pride uh, Center is the, um, the the Hudson County LGBT community center organization. They have a number of really great community events. They have support groups. They have resources available. Uh, they have uh, trans event, like uh, support groups for, for trans folk. Um, so I would say that, that that is a great resource to start with. Um, if we're looking specifically at resources for schools, um, GLSEN is a, a great organization that does actually provide a lot of uh, teacher training resources, classroom specific resources. Uh, on how can you address uh, non-binary issues, trans issues that come up in the classroom, um, building acceptance and, and inclusion and equity. Uh, there's, they, they, they actually, they, they provide 
a tremendous amount of, of resources and they actually have this deck of cards that I should have brought with where mm -hmm. they, they have the history of, of a number of, of famous queer folks and folks that I haven't, haven't heard of before that I, I wish I had because queer history is not taught in schools. Mm -hmm. Queer history is something that typically people have to learn outside of traditional formal education. So having resources available in schools that, that doesn't erase our history, I think is, is, is really important. So they, they actually have a, a great number of resources. Uh, there is a camp called uh, Tertium Quid for trans kids that's actually run through Hudson Pride uh, Center. There is also a camp called Camp Highlight that is um, for, I believe, kids of queer families and, and maybe queer kids themselves as well that's run at the in the summer. Um, I think it's in August. They also have a family camp event in the fall that uh, I think that we're actually going to try to go to this year, which yeah. would be which would be really exciting. Um, then there's also um, Rad Family, which is through North Jersey Pride. They provide a lot of resources for families, connections, community groups. Um, there's the Trans Mentor Project, um, which we found out about at the at North Jersey Pride when we were there uh, a few weeks ago. And actually, I think we do have some slides that have some some of the the resources um, that we that we've seen. And, and all of these resources are things that we try to put up um, in in either our Instagram or in our Facebook groups. So people actually are, are aware of these events. Um, North Jersey Pride has a teen club. I think they're meeting virtually now, so you don't even have to travel far to to interact with other other teens that are um, queer or or somehow identify within within that that queer framework um, so there's a lot of, of really great community maybe we can make a list and, and share it on can, the uh, on the YouTube page absolutely. afterward that, that for anyone who you know who's still here or if you have to leave soon um, this will be archived on the museums you get to page so maybe we can put some more resources there as well some links. links yeah. yeah. And I also say that there's a lot of school groups that are now starting to get really active outside of just their individual school. Like GSAs or? Not, so um, GSAs to some, to some extent, but there was mm -hmm. there's a group that I don't remember their name, um, but it was a gender, actually, maybe it was the, the campaign for gender inclusivity. And it's a, it's a school, it's a student run group that's mm -hmm. trying to bring more visibility and awareness and acceptance equity to trans and non-binary kids throughout North Jersey. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a grassroots yeah. activity. It's 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 coming from the, the kids working their way up, which I think is that's amazing. It's fantastic. Just to think outside of your school, outside your immediate yeah. community and see the impact you can make. Students are amazing. Are they? <laughs> kids and teens are amazing. Um, they're really our future, you know, I mean, in so many ways, but obviously I think for the LGBTQ community, we should be looking to them and in a big way. They're so empowered. Yeah. And we want to make sure that they continue to feel empowered and supported and mentored um, by, I'm not going to call myself an elder, but by um, individuals <laughs> who are older <laughs> in, the, in the queer community. Yeah. A queer elder, um, you know, doesn't necessarily mean we're very old. It just, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. So as we close up, I wonder uh, what message you might like to share for LGBTQ parents looking to find community right now. Um, what would you tell them? What would you share with them? How would you empower them? If you're in the area, we'd love to have you join our group, come and meet up with us. Um, and if you're not in the area, uh, see if there's other groups that are local to you that you can join up with. Maybe there's a local Facebook group or a local library group that has uh, events that you can can join. Um, start your own group. That's what we did because we, we weren't able to find a lot of resources uh, last year. And we have made some really great connections with other, other queer families. Um, but happy to have everyone join up with with Hoboken Rainbow Family or or something else if, if that's if that's more comfortable for you. Um, it's it's sometimes difficult to find community mm -hmm. when everyone has their own separate lives. 
and it does take effort. You, it's, it's not something that's necessarily going to be instantaneous, mm -hmm. um, but keep trying and, and reach out to, to community pride groups. Um, Hudson County pride would be, would be also, or pride center would be a great, a great place to find other like-minded, like-minded parents. And there's also, there, there are support groups. So if you're, if you have a kid that is trans or non-binary or, or queer, there are, there are actually PFLAG is actually a great, great example of that support group specifically for parents. So parents can, can find community and find resources that can, can help them as well. Wonderful. <laughs> Any Time closing? Slides? Yeah, actually that's, yeah, yeah. let's, let's do it. So this is at one of our uh, fun runs. We made signs so we could support everyone who was running because we were not. Uh, we had a queer Olympics and picnic festival um, August of last year as part of the the, the Hudson County Pride. It was um, it was actually a great event. We had a whole bunch of um, like javelin and. Oh, that's balloon so toss cool. and a <laughs> potato sack race. It was, it was a lot of fun. Playing a little loose with Olympics, but you know. <laughs> Quite loose with Olympics, I yes. It. it was queer Olympics. Yeah, exactly. Uh, queer story time, we actually had this at the um, at the, the museum last year in the, the outside little alleyway. And we had a bake sale. We made, actually made flags. So everyone got to design their own rainbow or other flag. I love it. Which was was great, and we read one of the uh, a pride book about actually the creation of the mm. first uh, pride flag, and then um, donations all went to the uh, Tertium Quid Camp via the um, Hudson Pride Center. Incredible. We had our very exciting pumpkin spice fest, where we had a bake comp uh, baking competition, um, pumpkin. Spice was required in that competition, of course. Um, and of course, Harmonica Sunbeam came and did uh, Drag Queen Bingo, which was a lot of fun for everyone. Long games, big, uh, baking competition. I mean, what else What else can you that ask for? That is so fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, our most recent event was the, the Hoboken Rainbow Family um, Pride, Climb with Pride event at the Gravity Vault. Uh, we had that a few Sundays ago. Um, and actually, Gravity Vault is, is a really great ally. They mm. they've been um, they've they've had a few Pride events. And they also have this rainbow wall at the very front of the when you when you first walk in. And anyone that climbs to the top of the rainbow wall and pressed the little button um, triggered a donation to the um, Hudson Pride that Center. That is incredible. Throughout, throughout June. So there's still another few hours today. So if you are a, a climber, <laughs> you can go to, to Gravity Vault tonight mm -hmm. and, and climb up the rainbow wall a few times and, and press that buzzer to get. That's really taking oh. allyship, corporate allyship to the next level, really making it actionable. Yeah. Yeah. That's and fun. And, and fun. That's amazing. Yeah. And it's on the rainbow wall. So, well, what could be more fun? <laughs> And then, so this is actually some, some photos from, this is the rainbow wall. If you get to the top, there's that little buzzer. Uh, we actually did screen printing. So we had a, a design that we, we printed up with um, Hoboken Rainbow Family and Gravity Vaults together, and then had t-shirts and, and bags that, that people could, could screen print in, in their uh, choice of colors, pink or black. And then our um, safe space. Logo. This was actually one of the ones that we did at the the um, museum event, the beginning of June. So this is the, the the logo that we had for that. That's so fun. And then this is our our next event. So our book club is the Itty Bitty Book Club. We are actually we read Nimona for our last event, and then our next one is going to be um, Rick. Is it Itty Bitty because they're small books? You try to choose small books, or we try to read. We try to choose books that are actually um, that that someone can read in, in a, the space a, of a month, mm, but mm. not have to take the entire month to read. Sure, sure. We made the mistake once of having a book that was a little bit more dense, and um, I don't think anyone finished it that month. That's fair. <laughs> we actually, all of our book clubs are now going to be at Uncle Milton's Cafe. Uncle Milton, um, member of the queer community in Hoboken, has generously offered to 
allow or to have to host a safe space for kids after school, um, three to six. Um, still figuring out timing, but mm -hmm. but we have a little alcove filled with a whole bunch of books, resources, but also like just fun books, usually with some sort of- That have a permanent home there? They the have cafe? a permanent wow. home there at the cafe. There's actually a whole bunch of games as well. And then there's a whole bunch of swag in the little drawer. So if you want stickers or, or pins, you can go check out the- We saw your stickers, I think drawer. a few slides back. They're yeah. super cute. Swag drawer at Uncle Milton's. And then, so this is, th these are some of the, the resources that we've that we've found um, at some of the pride events so rad family they have resources for um, trans kids gender fluid kids non-binary kids um, but also they, they provide resources for both educators and parents how, how are some ways that you can can provide gender inclusivity in schools um, what are ways that you can you can really develop a, an mm -hmm. accepting open inclusive classroom but also um, not just the classroom but but make it so people feel comfortable to take it out of the classroom mm -hmm. um, this is the campaign for gender inclusivity this is the one that was the student run they do have a website uh, that has some really great resources so really encourage everyone to check that out um, and their instagram account they were so incredibly inspiring i was so proud of, of all of them Amazing. Um, another resource available, this is the African American Office of Gay Concerns. Um, really, we also really like when there are um, intersectionality mm -hmm. of resources. So not just um, white queer people. Queer people uh, come, yeah, every, like anyone mm -hmm. can be queer. So it's important to make sure that there are resources available for. And like we spoke about before, groups. the layering of community, yeah. you know, uh, finding ways that, to make sure that everyone feels um, welcome, but finds people like them, not just on this one level of being queer, but all the way down. Yeah, you know. Exactly. Um, this is one of the, the, the education groups. So, how can we um, make our schools? safer for for queer kids um, and really like concrete actions for what steps can teachers take mm -hmm. to make their there's their classrooms an inclusive classroom and this is the one that i'm most excited about the the trans mentoring project um, specifically for trans and non-binary teens and this is something that i actually wish that they were um, offering for for younger kids as well but they're starting mm -hmm. off with with the teenagers um, but they, they were really excited and, and really happy to talk with us, even though Wixie doesn't qualify quite yet. <laughs> Soon, maybe they'll do a tween maybe, yeah. program someday. That's really wonderful mentorship, really. It's so important. Yes. And then this is our, our upcoming. upcoming event. So we are going to be reading Rick, which is the, not sequel, but it's in the same world as Melissa. Um, and we're going to be reading it um, in July. So pick up your books. Borrow them from the library. Yes, um, and then we'll be discussing it the the last Sunday in July at twelve o'clock at Uncle Milton's Cafe. Any last words? Oh, I'm so glad that we had to ha we, that we were oh, able to have this conversation. Yes. It was it was really <laughs> great. Um, I, I really hope that that if people are looking for for an organization like Hoboken and Book Family that that. Um, that you found us and that if you're not in town that there is an organization like ours that, that you can find to to build that own your own community wherever you are. But clearly Jean is a connector. So if you are from another town, get in touch and and you know you're connected with with other organizations all around North Jersey. So there's definitely um, you know opportunity for you to, there's to find your community. There's a ton of resources everywhere. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Well, I am going to take over. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how do I get? There we go. <laughs> that was Hoboken Talks. Coming up, we've got Peter Gutierrez. And after that, April Harris. Peter, um, uh, I don't know how many years ago, he had an exhibit up here in the upper gallery where we're filming of, of his um, the pl handmade planes. He was a young man. Um, and April Harris, 
runs the uh, the um, food bank uh, in Jesus' name, something like that, in God's love. I'm so sorry, April, I forgot. Um, but she's doing wonderful work in Hoboken and helping with hunger. So um, look, looking forward to that. Um, we uh, like to thank the memory of Mel Kiernan. Mel was a big supporter of the museum who left some uh, um, financial resources uh, to the museum in his, uh, in his will. Um, just wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, the New Jersey Historical Commission. Uh, we, we got a grant from them for some technology that helps make this show possible. The New Jersey Council for the Humanities helps us do all kinds of wonderful things here at the museum. The Shipyard Circle, they are the, the big donors to the museum, but we love all our donors and we love all our members. And we even just love regular folks who come by who, who pay the admission and, and, and look at our exhibits. So um, thank you to the Shipyard Circle. We, we, we know you're, you love us a lot. So. Uh, also, the Applied Development Company, they, they provide us with the space. We thank them every day because um, we have a, uh, they just gave up, they, they donated this space to us, or we have a, a lease um, from them for an incredible, like a dollar a year for 99 years. So, so they, they, they're big supporters of the museum. They, they support us in many other ways as well. So thank you to Applied. Um, please come by the museum at 1301 Washington, um, Hudson Street. We've got an exhibit called The Avenue. It's the history of Washington Street. There is a map. There are many photos. Um, there are artifacts from our collection, all about what people call The Avenue, also known as Washington Street. Um, come on by. We, people have a lot of fun um, checking out uh, what, what we're offering. Uh, upstairs, we've got about mm, three more days of Lou Carbone's paintings. We are sitting among them right now. They are really, really cool. And uh, they will be coming down, I believe, on Sunday. Um, and uh, then we've got some photographs from the 70s and 80s by Carol Halabian. And we're calling the show when we were young. Um, these photos are the best. They're, they're just really cool. It's always fun to see color photos of Hoboken from the old days. Um, so uh, look forward to that opening on July 10th. Oh, um, Carol will also be doing a, a live stream um, with Bob Foster, I believe, on July 8th. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, ring the bell so you get the notifications on YouTube that this thing is happening. Um, that's always that's that's how you can keep keep up with what we're up to. Um, yeah, like this. Comment, like, share, and subscribe. You comment on our videos. That helps us out. You like our stuff. You share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe to our channel. Um, we consider you. We pay the most attention to our YouTube channel, um, although we do stream out to Twitter and Facebook. Um, but that's just how it goes. Uh, and, and, and that is it. Thank you so much. And uh, I believe this is our final live stream for Pride. So thank you so much. And, and um, it's just, it's been a great month. We, <laughs> I love that passageway event. And I've really enjoyed all of the uh, wonderful uh, um, Hoboken Talks events that we've had. And uh, We'll see you around. Here we go. I'm going to end the broadcast. Farewell.